And he said, come back. Right. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Ed Bogish. I'm the director of the Syracuse COE. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all here. Many friends, friends know our, our program of monthly research and technology forums. It's brought to you by the partner program of the Syracuse COE. If your firm or organization is not yet a partner, you want to talk to Pam Rosario there in the back. And she'll be happy to tell you all the benefits of a partner who is a Syracuse COE. Um, today we've got a, a terrific program, and I'm pleased to uh, introduce Bess Friedemeyer, who will moderate the program. Uh, Bess is an assistant professor at the Syracuse University School of Architecture, where she teaches studios and technical courses emphasizing environmental performance within architectural design. Bess's research focuses on the ways in which emerging material technologies, human behavior, and computational simulation processes inform the design of sustainable built environments. Before joining Syracuse, the faculty at Syracuse University a year and a half ago, um, Dr. Friedemeyer conducted interdisciplinary research as a Haas Fellow at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute Center for Architectural Science and Ecology, where she received her PhD in Architectural Sciences. She's practiced with, I'm going to help me, Lebrano Ciavara, <laughs> architects, and with Case and Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill on the design of international product projects that integrate next generation building technologies. Bess's research has been published and presented in several peer-reviewed forums, including installations at the Hendershot Gallery in Manhattan and at the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center in Troy, as well as Smart Geometry, the International Society for Optics and Photonics, and many other places. <laughs> it's a recipient of the Art King Medal for Excellence in Architecture. Bess has recently co-authored book chapters in Architecture in Formation, and Inside Smart Geometry, Expanding the Architectural Possibilities of Computational Design. Uh, I've been pleased over the last uh, six months or so to host a, uh, say a prototype of a laboratory uh, that Bess envisions uh, constructing, hopefully here in the building someday, up, up on the fifth floor. There's an opportunity later, later today. Um, I'm putting Bess on the spot that uh, we may be happy to, to show uh, any, anyone who's interested, uh, some of our work that's uh, that's available to you. Without further ado, my pleasure to introduce Bess Friedemann. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with Bess to be a part of such a unique forum that is bridging topics that we might not normally associate together. Um, how historic works of art and architecture inspire innovations in building technologies. We have two very excellent speakers today, Joseph Kowalski and Bill Chadwick, who will each discuss this area from two different perspectives. Our first speaker is Joseph Kowalski. Joseph is an assistant professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture, where he teaches courses in science studios, history, and theory of architecture. <laughs> After receiving his undergraduate degree in architecture here at Syracuse, he practiced architecture in Zurich and in Boston on a range of urban design projects and university research buildings. He's also worked on museum projects with Eisenman Architects in New York City, and he's collaborated on multi-use residential projects in San Diego and in San Francisco. Joseph received his Master of Science degree in Architectural History and Theory from UC Berkeley, where he was part of the Global Metropolitan Studies Program, where his research examines emerging patterns in urban development. Joseph has served as a peer reviewer for a range of books and journals, as well as an invited critic in many architecture schools. He's previously taught studios and history and theory courses, specifically in Renaissance architecture, at both at UC, UC Berkeley and at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Joseph's presentation today is titled Deus Ex Machina, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and HVAC, where he'll discuss the cultural significance of Michelangelo's frescoes at the Sistine Chapel and why they are worth preserving. 
So please join me in welcoming Joseph Travis. Push the button. Right. The big button on top here. Let's see. No, no try to move the button. There you go. Oh, you're you're Happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Gus, and the COE uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm excited by the partnerships, uh, indeed the synergy between the COE and the School of Architecture. I hope this is one of many projects that join forces uh, together. Um, I intend my talk to be brief, largely pictorial, um, serving as an introduction to Bill's pre presentation, which I anxiously await. Not the, not the silver ones, the big black ones. Right. Just this couple. Okay. Yeah. Does the wheel work? Yep. Just, just like that. Right. On your finger, there you go. Uh, okay. Um, the art historian and, and director general of the Vatican Museums. Antonio Paolucci opens his book writing, every day at least 20,000 people come to the Sistine <coughs> Chapel, people of all origins, languages, cultures, and religions, or even people with no religion. The Sistine Chapel is an irresistible attraction, the object of desire for international museum goers and migrants of so-called cultural tourism. The chapel, however, though, Part of a museum uh, visit is not a museum in itself. It's a religious place and a consecrated chapel. Moreover, it's a place which truly holds the identity of the Roman Catholic Church. Paolucci's aim is to orient uh, visitors to this creation. My aim is very similar. Uh, I intend to reflect on the cultural significance of Michelangelo's frescoes at the Sistine Chapel and ask why endeavors like those of Bill and the Carrier Corporation are so crucial. This presentation examines the socio-political context of these groundbreaking pieces of art and architecture during the Renaissance and their renewed importance today. Along the way, I'll discuss a few misconceptions about the frescoes and convey the powerful environmental experience one has from visiting them. Now this um, is exactly what Bill didn't want to do. Um, this is an installation at the recent uh, Biennale in Venice, curated by the architect Graham Kohlhaas. Um, this is Kohlhaas's tongue-in-cheek commentary on the state of art, the architectural profession today. Um, it's a situation where modernization has run amok, and architects are simply handmaidens to the technological demands of buildings, systems, and codes. The once enlightening uh, experience is conveyed by you know, architecture like like this, um, is blocked. Um, this is an architecture um, up, up here, which is a kind of a professional role, actually invented during the Renaissance of Michelangelo's time. It's an architecture of, of Brunelleschi, Romante, people like Alberti. Uh, before the Renaissance, architects did not hold this privileged position. Um, many medieval cathedrals, for example, uh, we do not know who designed them. Which is, Kind of strange. Um, they were made piecemeal by, by a guild of craftsmen and builders. It isn't until Michelangelo's time that the designer held uh, the designer held so much uh, creative and authorial agency. Um, this is something that Kohlhaas is lamenting, lamenting and has, has it argues has been eroded by the role of technology. 
So in this regard, I see the innovative HVAC solution put forth by Bill and his team as acting as what they called in Greek tragedy as a deus ex machina. Uh, literally translated from Latin means God from a machine, device, <coughs> scaffolding. So deus ex machina was a plot device whereby seemingly un unsolvable problem was fixed by the unexpected intervention of some new event, ability, or object. In the plays, an actor would be hoisted up and kind of set down on, onto the stage um, to, save the, to save the day. Not much unlike the way the Advanced Tech Solution Center um, designed a system tailored to the unique needs of the Sistine Chapel. They resolved the paradox of the condition presented by Full House with a nearly invisible system, which at it, which it once prevents the degradation of the frescoes, while also preserving the work and the intentions of the Renaissance master. This presents a both and condition where, where technology and art coexist. Uh, this, is, this is contrasted to the pessimistic either or condition uh, presented by, by Kohlhaas and others. So returning back to the 16th century here, um, the picture here is Michelangelo di Lodovico Buonarroti Simone. Invited by Florence to Rome by, Ju by Pope Julius II in 1508 to paint the ceiling as a symbol of power. It was Julius who began the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica in 1506, the most potent symbol and source of papal power. Michelangelo had been designing the Pope's funerary temple when he was called to paint the frescoes, at which point he was frankly disappointed uh, when his energies were redirected. The Renaissance master, you know, here's this guy, like, famous to everyone as being this amazing artist, uh, lamented, I'm no painter, um, which was partially true because until this point, he did mostly just sculpture. So one misconception is that Michelangelo painted the ceiling lying on his back. Um, depicted here is uh, Charlton Heston in the film The Agony and the Ecstasy, where he's like this, this powerful, uh, heroic figure. Um, in fact, Michelangelo wrote a satirical sonnet and character himself actually standing um, while painting. So you get things like this. Uh, the delicate fresco themselves were made using a, a, a blown fresco, um, so that means kind of a true fresco technique, mixing pigment, pigment with wet plaster and letting the color literally dry into the surface. At times, another layer uh, or a kind of fresco secco was used over this plaster <coughs> layer. And some have argued, um, look here, some have argued that some of these details were erased by the restoration cleaning efforts of the 1990s. Um, here's a before and after detail with purport to show this discrepancy. So literally the, the foot kind of uh, actually changes shape um, here, um, and the, the, the shadow essentially disappears. So a lot of the, the kind of high contrast that Michelangelo had set up um, was, was removed and, uh, by, this, by this last um, kind of effort to clean up the things. Um, I think a lot of this kind of controversy runs beyond the, the kind of realm of my talk today, but it is an interesting thing for future discussion. Um, a second misconception is that Michelangelo was a struggling artist, um, as dramatically portrayed by Heston. So he's, you know, he's wearing these rags and he's like he's this individual um, and he has this very hard life. Um, however, um, this is only partially true. Um, according to the scholar and my teacher in Florence, um, uh, Professor Rab Hatfield, Michelangelo was in fact the wealthiest artist of all time when he began the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. At this point, he had already done the Pietà and David, two of the most iconic sculptures in art history. Um, he had these under his belt. It's estimated that he was worth tens of millions of dollars at this point, but he chose to live as a pauper, uh, hoarding massive sums of gold in his small, unadorned apartment in Rome. It's after his work at the Sistine Chapel was spanned over 30, 30 years that he begins doing architectural projects. The frescoes show Michelangelo at his inventive prime, from the grace of the ceiling frescoes to the complexity and furor of the Last Judgment on the Sanctuary Paul. His is a work of creative genius, enormously influential to generations of painters and scholars for centuries after. Goethe has been quoted as saying, 
without having seen the Sistine Chapel, one could form no appreciable idea of what man is capable of achieving. <clears throat> so the frescoes at the chapel, I argue, are a turning point in several respects. So first, they, but they mark a clear distinction from the medieval scholasticism of the era prior to the Renaissance in a transition to later phases of Mannerist and Baroque art, which came about during the Counter-Reformation. This art carries much more drama than that of earlier areas. The frescoes were at once new and also prefigure uh, future artwork. The art and architecture of the Renaissance was serene, restrained, uh, reason tended to be very abstract, whereas Michelangelo's work is much more complex, dynamic, layers, uh, muscular, and, and quite inventive. Um, the frescoes also mark a turning point in the work of Michelangelo. So before this commission, he was principally a sculptor. The works of the Sistine Chapel, however, merge art and architecture. The illusory architecture painted into the vault um, actually kind of uh, extend the space. So the, the, the trunk boy or the architectural framework <coughs> creates a masterpiece of perspectival illusion. So this chapel is an all-encompassing spatial appearance, much more a work of architecture than a static uh, sculpture. So after the work of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo translations to his later work as an architect, um, you know, designing these like these famous uh, Ricetto stairs um, at the Laurentian Library, which kind of the sculpture would flow out of this uh, reading room like lava. Um, he does uh, an, an addition to the uh, St. Peter's uh, Cathedral, like he gets called in on this. So he has also a very sculptural um, uh, way of dealing with this. Um, he, he works on the Campidoglio in Rome, as well as the Palazzo uh, Farnese, also in Rome. Now, the chapel itself uh, is built in the 15th century. So it's very much a fortress-like uh, medieval architecture meant to protect, much more than it's intended to inspire. So the space is simple, and the construction is very heavy and, and thick. Um, some of these walls get as thick as two or three meters um, in, in depth. Uh, with these very small um, carved windows where light is able to, to filter through. Um, the Sistine Chapel has this shallow barrel ball, so it's, it's very, um, it, you know, when you're looking at the kind of uh, paintings, this, this seems to extend forever into this, like, uh, element beyond, but it's actually quite a, um, a shallow uh, barrel ball, about 40 meters long and 13 meters wide. So this is the same dimension as Solomon's Temple from the Bible, um, and the central part of which is almost flat. So when Michelangelo arrived, the ceiling was adorned with this just simple um, kind of astral pattern. Oops. Um, and his art, his, his art and architecture uh, fundamentally transforms and extends the space uh, up into the heavens. Um, so this is the, the back of the chapel, uh, looking forward towards the altar. The entire experience of the chapel has been likened to a dream by psychoanalytic scholars. So we're, we're submerged into this dizzying space of layered meanings, uh, false perspective, and these, these kind of bending columns, which aren't actually there, they're just kind of painted on. So the, the architecture continues up and actually gets uh, twisted. Um, we're confronted with over um, 300 figures dramatically foreshortened, looking down upon us. Light cascades in to illuminate the story of creation and the second coming of Christ. Um, the ceiling itself is divided into nine scenes from the book of Genesis. Uh, the visual density of you know, looking up at something like this was really impossible to take, take in in one viewing. It's quite simply uh, overpowering. Um, attempts have been made to diagram um, the scenes depicted. So the sequence of the frescoes <laughs> runs from the altar to the entrance wall, um, whereas the order in which they're painted is actually in reverse. So that the most important scene from the standpoint of iconography, so um, the primal act of creation, um, which occupies the small rectangle immediately above the altar, um, was the actual um, last um, to be created. Uh, some highlights of this thing uh, include 
um, the original sin and the expulsion from, from paradise. So, like, incredibly um, realistic kind of looking. Um, the drama as well as the architecture framing of the view. Um, the, the deluge or the, the flood. So, get another one of these scenes from um, the Old Testament uh, being painted here. Um, and then the one probably everyone knows, um, the iconic creation of Adam, um, where it's been written that, that the microcosm of an incarnate word, word made in divine image issues from the hand of God as the fingers of the Father and the Son touch in a loving gesture. It's significant and convincing that the, the, the eternal is circumcised by a lips, symbolizing the, the cosmic act. Some had actually called um, a section of a kind of brain I figure um, the kind of brain center and all of this. Um, Michelangelo experiences the stages of creation within himself, um, retracing um, the, the the way the divine choice of double path to religion and art. Um, the space between God's uh, uh, finger and Adam's finger is perhaps one of the most highly charged spaces um, existing. Um, it's scarcely possible to put into words the impressions roused by this marvelous painting. It is though current passed from the painted scene up to the beholder, who often feels that he is assisting at a how hollow, world-shaping event. Um, so that all of that stuff happens in 1508 to 1512. To 1512. Uh, Thirty years later, he comes back and does the, the sanctuary wall, and he paints the, this masterpiece of the Last Judgment. Um, so here's a, a much older uh, Michelangelo. Um, so he's, he's actually quite a young man when he's doing the ceiling. But the, this, is, he's in the latter half of his career. Um, the Last Judgment is this striking uh, composition, to say the least. Um, <coughs> represented is his worldview of a kind of penitent man at the end of his life, who stands at the gates awaiting the eternal judgment from his creator. It, is, it was first seen as an immoral piece, uh, in, obscene and inappropriate. Um, so the, the Pope actually had people come in and actually cover up um, some of these uh, people. Um, here, um, here in this kind of sacred space, the space of the, the papal conflict where might actually pick the Pope, Michelangelo has adorned it with this brooding uh, whirlwind of, of uh, flesh. Um, it's a scene of exaltation and damnation, heaven and hell a tumult of bodies and muscular nudity. Um, you know, so here is a detail of all-powering kind of judge of Christ with, with Mary on his side. Um, St. Bartholomew here is looking up to the Christ figure. And actually within this, uh, Michelangelo has painted a self-portrait, um, actually in the flayed skin of, of, of Bartholomew. Um, so, you know. See the kind of resemblance. <laughs> um, so the painting in many ways is weird. It's, it's autobiographical. Um, it's overpowering and perplexing. Um, so like a dream, it leaves the viewer with just a trace memory of the expression of the experience as they descend back to the everyday uh, mortal world. The Last Judgment is a complex scene and a masterpiece of mannerist art. Uh, mannerism favors compositional tension and instability. Um, rather than the balance and clarity of earlier Renaissance painting. So to conclude, uh, Michelangelo's frescoes at the Sistine Chapel are groundbreaking works of art that combine <coughs> to create a dramatic spatio-temporal experience. Rich in religious and humanist imagery, their cultural significance is absolutely undeniable. The Sistine Chapel uh, ceiling was a work of unprecedented grandeur, both for its architectonic forms uh, to be imitated by many Baroque ceiling painters, and also for the wealth of its inventiveness and the study of figures. Faced with years of deterioration, the innovative HVAC solutions to preserve the frescoes act as a day of sex machina, saving the material <laughs> state of the surfaces, but also rescuing the creative agency of the Renaissance architect artist, a figure historically threatened by the delimiting forces of modernization. So the near invisible systems deployed by Carrier, and about to be discussed here at length, um, allow us to freely interact with this masterpiece without constraining its power to simultaneously inspire and to humble us. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Joseph. So we have some time for a couple of questions now for Joseph, and then we'll have more time after both of the presentations for an extended discussion with everyone. So we welcome any questions from the audience. I have an initial question. Sure. Uh, you had mentioned that Michelangelo was lamenting this idea that he would be a painter and that he didn't call himself a painter necessarily. Right. How then did he end up, or why, I guess, why did he end up getting commissioned? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Process. It's like, why, why get someone with, like, not, I mean, there were tons of painters at the time, tons of, like, uh, the best painters in the world, and, like, why get this guy that's just a sculptor to do this painting? It's, like, it's very strange. I think part of it is just that he was so persuasive and such a powerful, like, otherworldly artistic force. Um, the other had to do with the fact that he was already in town working on the kind of tomb for him until his energies were redirected. But then this is where like another layer of kind of Michelangelo and his kind of weird complexity comes in is because he actually dreamed up and he writes about this that 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 this was actually a plot by people like Ramonte, who was his competitor, um, and actually designing part of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, that somehow this was a plot against him, that, that he knew that he wasn't a good painter, and he's like, get him off this architecture thing, get him painting, have him make, make a fool out of himself, um, and, uh, and then like Ramonte will come up and be the great guy. I mean, chances are most people don't know who the hell Ramonte is, but they certainly know what the Sistine Chapel was. So that, that plan kind of backfired, if that really was. I think he was just being kind of uh, I don't know, paranoid, honestly. Uh, he tended to be a, a paranoid uh, kind of um, self-reflected person, as was shown in his kind of hoarding uh, tendencies um, as well. So yeah, that's a, it's a good question, but he, he certainly overcame that. There's also a lot of evidence for how he actually became a better painter as he went through the process. So it's like he, he started off and the, the pace was extremely slow, and so the, the speed and the kind of detail and the grandeur kind of picks up. So like I was saying, some of the most important ones are the ones that, that we know today uh, most iconically were actually the ones done last and were actually at, he was at the pinnacle of his inventive kind of painting skill. Right. Uh, do you know uh, any reason why Michelangelo drew and sculpted women so muscular. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's bulgy <laughs> muscles. Yeah, it's, it's, not everybody. <laughs> it's a very uh, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of scholars that have actually speculated that he, he never saw a, a new book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that like it, I mean it's interesting, like it, it's basically just guys that just have breasts kind of tapped on yeah. to them. Like, it's several it's several pages. I mean like I'm kind of too small to see um, here. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a whole kind of discourse about this. And like, they, they've actually looked a lot like that, that he may have been uh, homosexual and like that he, he has all these kind of love letters to uh, other men that, that he had and all this other stuff um, because he was, you know, he was never married or, or any of this. So it, it's speculated that he just never saw it. <laughs> so um, it, yeah. I, I mentioned that he like has this uh, this tendency to uh, paint very sculpturally and and con and have a high contrast and to really show off kind of the muscular nature of, of things. But this is just translated to men and women in fairly equal pose, which is a bit odd. Yeah. Yeah, talk about the at the time the relationship between the artist and the client. Right. Well, so. Is he given just carte blanche? Yeah, that yeah, like, here's here's the ceiling, here's the wall, go go at it, and then the Pope comes in and says, What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, and and so a lot has been written about this in like the Charlton Heston movie. This is a lot about like that conflicted relationship. So the, the movie isn't totally bogus, you know, it's like it's like it has some kind of um, elements of truth to it. But essentially from records and from the thing that he's written, you know, like Michael like Angel at the time is writing. He, he's basically, there's lines where he's like, they basically are letting me do whatever I want. <laughs> because like, as you can imagine, like, he's the richest, like, he's, he has an incredible ego um, at that point. 
And I think that it was actually his call to, like, there was a basic framework. It's like, here we want the Bible seeds depicted. And there's some kind of correlation between, like, some of the things that are shown and kind of the Botticelli and some of the existing ones in this layer, um, which, which he came to, and then translating that up above. So that was kind of a, uh, a cue for, like, possible things. But it was his call to look back to the Old Testament um, and actually do the kind of, like, archival um, older scholarly stuff. So he was actually a very good um, writer. Um, and a good reader and interpreter of things. So that's where a lot of the inventiveness came from, because most people at the time were <coughs> judging things from the New Testament. Um, so there's a sense that he basically got to do whatever he wanted. I think it was part of the deal where it's like, you know, okay. Think this you. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's like they had him out quarrying stone for eight months for the, the uh, Pope, the, the papal temple. Um, and then that gets sidetracked and like, here, paint this thing. Do whatever you want, and, and we took that to have full advantage of that. Yeah. And just a comment. According to the movie, Charles and Hesson and Rex Harrison were not in love with each other. No, no, no. <laughs> Charles and Hesson spat on the pole. Yes, from the Right, right. He's like throwing things down. Very good. I have an observation. If I look at the statues, okay, my statue did, the body is much better proportioned. Yeah. Okay? Right. Compared with all these frescoes where they have very small heads and huge bodies, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. look, look, look at Adam. Look at Adam. Okay. Look, look, okay. These are the right proportions, more or less. Right, right. Right? But if you go to the paintings, the heads are small compared with the bodies right, of right. all of them. Very muscular bodies, right. even when they have very small heads. Right. What happened? See, I think that this is partly what I was trying to say toward the end, where there is a transition which happens. So the beginning of his career is still a higher renaissance, where everything is about getting the accurate proportions. And like, although some have argued these hands are a little big. Um, in fact, another thing he did too is um, one of his clients said, you know, the nose is almost stuck. You know, I need to fix that. And so he's like, okay, and he didn't do anything. And then he revealed it again. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Picasso used the same technique. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so during the High Renaissance, you know, the proportion, getting proportions right was, was what you wanted to do. In the paintings, however, he's in this realm where he's exaggerating things. There's these extreme foreshortenings, and like the columns bend up, and there's a uh, there's false illusory perspective and things. Things aren't in the right proportion. Um, this tended to be more the kind of mannerist phase. So this is also like. Uh, where the church was changing as well. Because, you know, you have like in, in between the periods, like where he's starting to do the paintings and then he's doing the, uh, uh, the Last Judgment. And then you have the Sack of Rome and you have the beginning of the Counter-Reformation where things just become a bit more serious. Um, and there's an idea that you need to kind of shock people into belief or into like awe, awe of this kind of grandeur of the power of God. So. There's a sense that you can distort things to create that effect. So I don't think it's that, that suddenly his eyes went bad or like he wasn't, just wasn't getting it right anymore, or that he's like an inferior painter. Um, it, it was a kind of added effect where there is that distinct difference between the high renaissance and that mannerist, perhaps early Baroque period that, that he's in towards the end of his career. And the, the paintings are that turning point. OK. I think actually we are going to shift over to the next presentation. So, and we'll have more time for questions about both both presentations afterwards. So, thank you. Thank you. So, our next presenter is Bill Chadwick. Bill is a senior building systems engineer with the Global Engineering Advanced Systems Group at Carrier within the United Technologies Corporation. He's a registered professional engineer in four states, a lead accredited professional, and a certified energy manager. Bill has a long career in HVAC systems design, analysis, and integration, specializing in energy conservation, indoor air quality, and integrated building systems and controls, among many other related areas. Bill's work has been recognized across several venues, including a New York Indoor Environmental Quality Center five-year service award, as well as invitations to speak at national 
technical meetings for the Air and Waste Management Association, Carrier, and ASHRAE. Bill has played a major role on projects ranging from healthcare and laboratory remodeling, university research building retrofits, and industrial plant air conditioning. A longtime Syracuse COE collaborator, Bill was also heavily involved in the design of this building at the Syracuse <coughs> Excellence Headquarters. Most recently, Bill was one of the leading specialists for Carrier's global team of expert engineers developing an innovative HVAC solution for the Vatican Sistine Chapel in order to help preserve Michelangelo's masterpieces against deterioration <coughs> primarily caused by the increasing number of visitors. So in his presentation titled The Art of the Invisible, Bill will discuss the significant role that high technology is now playing in preserving some of our most important masterpieces, works of art and architecture, for future generations. So please join me in welcoming Bill Chetwick. I wish I had seen your presentation before going over there. I would have, I would have, I would have enjoyed the significance of what we were seeing instead of chasing down ductwork and diffusers and all that other stuff, <laughs> which I did a lot of. All right. This presentation is based on what was presented at the dedication conference back in the very end of October this year when this project that started about four years ago came to culmination. So I'm, I'm working, if you will, on an engineering presentation, but I want to make sure we get engaged a little bit. So before we go, we have a feeling of you know, what, what has happened inside. I want to have a little discussion. The before restoration and the after restoration, that's when we did our first work back in the 90s. So we've got that activity there that we started. The restoration started in the 80s, last, what, 12, 19 was, years was almost? 80s. This was in the mid 80s when they did this restoration. So I'm kind of interested, how many people have been to the Sistine Chapel? Have you been there recently? Okay, very good, very good. And if you haven't been there in the last month and a half, you've got to go back again. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of things have changed. It's, it's part of a, an ongoing conservation effort. Uh, when uh, Antonio Pialucci, the museum director, and you'll see this more, I'm going to play a, a movie at the end when we're done with this that sort of goes through the details of all of our efforts and the response from the Vatican people. But basically, there is now in the chapel, in Italian, Nuovo Respiro, New Breath, and also Nuovo Luce, New Light. If you notice the pictures that were in Joe's presentation, they were with the old light and with the old breath. And I've got a couple in here that show the new stuff. And I think you'll be amazed if you've been on a Syracuse kind of day in the chapel and they don't have the lights turned on. It's not a very bright place. And they now have 7,000 LEDs lighting the ceiling and the walls. So it's a fantastic place. I think you'll really enjoy it. This, I believe, is still one of the old pictures. Yes, I still see the old lights there. It's hard to get the new picture, but there may be one in here. But that is the same Santa Maria doors opposite the altar. We had the experience, the, the people at the dedication ceremony, they brought us in at night. After all the visitors were gone, it was empty. And the people who were at the celebration, there was seven or 800 of us, they opened up the doors just like this. We walked in, it was a night lighting, very dimly lit, and they brought up the LEDs, and it was like the middle of the day, it was just awesome, very inspiring. Now, one of the guys from the carrier team is connected to, through his cell, you know, his smartphone, the control system running the air conditioning, he was quickly checking to see if we're maintaining set point and doing everything, because we brought in 800 people all at once, and 10 minutes later, we all left again. It responded. It did well. So we're very excited. I guess if I bump the podium, it advances the slide. So here is the whole of the Vatican. 
the entire country. We're down here with a little teeny piece, just a, a small in the shadow of the basilica. There's the Google Earth picture. And the point of interest to us is that little teeny piece. That's where all the air conditioning equipment sits hidden. That's the old view of the engineer who did the actual drawings, a Rome engineer by the name of Kroger, very good consulting firm. They fitted these details together. So those on the left is what he looked at the end of the 90s, or the beginning of the 90s when we put in a system. And on the right, the equipment. <laughs> no, I think um, the underfloor air distribution system floor is flexing a little bit. We've been walking around and it's advancing the slide. So we'll pull back. Yeah, one way or the other. So you'll see this is a room full of air handlers, a little bit of ductwork going under the windows much larger room, we've got some heat projection equipment on top, and we hid some chillers down in some little pieces down in here. And you'll see the details about this. There is a system supplying 30,000 CFM to the chapel and many, many tons of air conditioning all hidden in that view. All right. So these are the actual components I want to go through on the talk that was presented. We'll go through the challenge, what the actual project was all about, what our solution was, some performance highlights. In the video I'm going to wait until we're all done so I don't have to go back and forth. Welcome to the Sorry. <laughs> so here's the challenge we had to work with. Original system, 700 people. If you're there and you're in the room with 700 people, it's pretty crowded. If you're there a number of times in the last five years, over 2,000 people, significant. Imagine this room with about eight times as many people are in this room right now. That's the way the whole chapel was, just very, very tight. And because of this, we have found that carbon dioxide concentrations have gotten quite high. The preservation of the frescoes, which the plaster is a calcium carbonate, and if you get moisture in a high concentration, liquid water in a high concentration of CO2, you start forming carbonic acid, which will dissolve the calcium carbonate, and you'll end up with a calcium bicarbonate dusting or white clouding if it comes out to the surface, and they actually had that happen. There was some conservation done five years ago. And they said, we've got to worry about that CO2. We were not concerned about it originally. So this is a change from the first design system. So the actual performance characteristics that we had to meet, that's still there. If, like right now in this room with the radiant ceilings and, very, and the underfloor distribution, we're below still air conditions. You can feel a light breeze when you're in the chapel. It's controlled, it's regular. If you're standing on the opposite wall, the air comes in on the south wall and then cascades down into the lower part of the chapel. We look for temperature between 20 and 25. That is within the comfort range. 20 is a little cool for the winter time. 25 is a little warm for the summer. So far, our performance on the new system has held constant, almost rock solid, 22.5. We're going to try to hold that. The frescoes want steady state conditions. Don't vary, particularly over quick time periods. Do not vary temperature and relative humidity. You don't want to flux going back and forth into the actual uh, substrate of the plaster itself. We still have to remove the particulates. We as individuals shed a lot of skin, we bring in dust, we have hair, there's a lot going on that we are the pollutants. This system was designed for the preservation of the frescoes, not for the comfort conditions of the visitors. We just happen to be able to hold within a band that most people find comfortable. The old system, back when it was first put in, a lot of the local people in the museum would come and stay 
in the Sistine Chapel because it was the only air-conditioned part of the whole museum complex. And they were like, come on, go, go look at the rest of the museum. We now have a redundant system. We have a system on a variable frequency drive. So when the load reduces, we back down on the airflow, very quiet, unable to really hear the sounds of the airflow in the space, let alone the equipment that is just outside. But like Joe said, 10 feet of brick and masonry, an awful lot of uh, sound bending capability. Only the windows themselves are somewhat acoustically porous. So again, what we had to do is respect the architecture. I spent quite a bit of time proposing alternative solutions, talking about using the windows on the north side. Can we come in on the Cantoria, which is a little choir loft, and introduce some air at the lower level? Can we open up the floor more and get better return on and on? No, no, no. It's entirely painted. You can't do anything. You've got to live with what you have. So we had to increase airflow. We had to still worry about velocity. Of course, they want a more efficient system than what we put in before. And we wanted, we were told, maintain the access by the visitors during the construction changeup. So those were the parameters that we had to fit under this job. Let's look at the project. There's our team. Jackie and I are here. The gentleman to Jackie's right is uh, Michelle Grabon, who leads our group from France, down in uh, Montreal, uh, near Lyon. And uh, Aritz Calvo, another young engineer on the job, and Aritz did a lot of the control work and a lot of the equipment selection from our group over in France. Always doing modeling and simulation, and we have enough capability. We did testing here with the diffuser for the airflow management. We've done testing of all the equipment in Lyon before we even ship. We, we dry ran everything. So, we essentially did a Henry Ford. We disassembled it, took it to Greenfield Village, put it back together, and turned it out again. For those of you familiar with Greenfield Village, I see somebody smiling. That was what I'm talking about. I grew up in Michigan. So, a two-year development program. A lot of fluid dynamic simulation. I'm not sure how many hours your machine ran, Jackie, but it ran a lot. <laughs> we did quite a bit of work. My colleague, Jackie, who's over here, uh, raise your hand so because we're giving you a lot of credit for this work. She did fantastic work. We, we analyzed the temperatures, the CO2, and of course down below velocity because when you're introducing a large quantity of air, you're going to get a high degree of shear and mixing, which entrains the other air in the space and blends it in, but we've got to slow it down. We don't want to impact the walls because we'd be scrubbing the frescoes, and particularly if there's any dirt or a particulate matter, it's almost abrasive to the surface of the frescoes. Simulation was done um, statically. Uh, what we call an integrated performance model is what Carrier uses for determining capabilities of all the individual components. We can tie them all together on a refrigerant flow or other you know, dynamic material. And we, again, ran it on a computer model over and over and over until we got it to the point where we were happy with it. Then we'd go build it and test it in the lab. The diffuser. You'll see it in one of the pictures, but essentially what was there originally was a rectangular diffuser back by the window, and we tripled the amount of air coming into the space, so somehow we had to get more area. So extend it out from that window at the back of the wall, flared it like a trumpet in both directions, put a couple dividers in to try to convince the air to stay put, use all the cross-sectional area, get the velocities down a little bit, and it didn't want to do it. On the left, the original design, we essentially lost the attachment of the airflow from the wall of the diffuser, so it's, it's out into free space now. We're, we're no longer diffusing it came up with an innovative design of putting a perforated plate across the areas that had the highest velocities. So we basically said, let's try to impede the center throat of the diffuser and the other portions where we're seeing the largest amount of flow, convince the air to spread out more and give us an entry velocity into the chapel that's low enough that we're not going to be banging into the walls on the other side. We had the ability of using 3D printers, which are now pretty commonplace in the, the air management group at Carrier. I think 
There's up to five of them now in that little lab in the back. And so we originally made a quarter scale model of the diffuser to test in our wind tunnels, but then we put together an even smaller model to look at the fit up of the diffuser with the window, with the wall, the step, and all that kind of stuff. So we were able to dynamically in 3D take a look at this solution. Not every window is the same size. So we had to find the lowest common denominator. We ended up with the smallest of the openings being what we did times six for all of the windows. Did it work? So this is what we had originally. One's through, one air handler. A very nice machine made in the mono well by the factory there back in the 90s. Six outlets underneath the windows blowing the air in. No return. Now, I don't know if you would notice the details when you visited there, but there's a little return in the center of the floor. And the doors where you would come in by the altar or leave over there on the corner by the cantoria or way in the back were almost always 100% left open. The space was under positive pressure. They just let the air go, and it essentially exhausted into other parts of the museum complex. Now on the new system, we've doubled everything. We took away two of the supplies and put in return so we could have recirculation. We've cross-connected everything so that if we lose any one major component on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, we can keep anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the total capacity still active. We did end up sneaking a little bit of extra room under the window. I think we got another 10 centimeters in height. And then, so in essence, when we gave away two of the supplies for returns, we got the square centimeters back, square meters back. But with triple the amount of air, we are now triple the velocity. So we had quite a bit of work to get that reduced down. And have succeeded in doing that with the diffuser design. We used a, a screw chiller made in France. It's a heat recovery unit. So we will take the heat on the heat projection side if we need it for reheat because to do the high degree of moisture control, we will subcool the air in the humid conditions, bring the moisture out of it, and then we'll bring the temperature back up with the reheat on the recovered energy from the compression cycle. Air handling units, two of them. If you take a look at underneath the air handler, you'll see it's sitting on structural beams. There, there was a, um, a grill work put in later, and you'll see another picture in a minute. None of the weight of the new equipment either chillers or any of those directly bore on the terraces or rooftop areas that they gave us. It was transferred out to columns and the columns were dropped down to a more substantial footing. So we had as big a structural job to do even compared to the standard air conditioning work that you might think of us doing. Dry coolers sit on top of the room where the air handlers are and they're right near the windows. Off to your right, this is a picture with a little scaffolding in it still. But they are oversized and run at very low speed, and they have VFDs on them as well. And just to reiterate again, dual systems. They are cross-connected. That picture doesn't show it, but two of everything. We gave back some space that was there in the old system. We used to have a cooling tower on a different terrace nearby, that's gone. We used part of the basement for the old chiller, that's gone. So we actually gave back, if you will, the traded space. We got more roof space and gave them back some other space that they are going to put to good use. On the right, you can see the structural work going in right into some of the wall of the chapel and then let's see, I think this is the structural work for the dry coolers on top of the air handlers. So there's wood structure under the air handlers and there's a roof structure above it that holds up the dry coolers. That's a reads inside one of the small machinery rooms that we shipped fully piped. 
all the pumps, all the piping, all the controls completed ahead of time, brought to the site in the box, basically set into place, and then the interconnecting piping between that component and the air handling units further up. Control system, originally carrier comfort network back in the 90s. We upgraded it to an automated logic system, a web control system, probably seven, eight years ago when we went ahead and did this work. It remained the web control system. We're running everything, all interactive. It's very nice. Uh, I was able during the design to uh, log on through the URL from our basement in my I couldn't do it from the company computer because we weren't allowed. But uh, I could get into the Vatican and look at how the system was performing quite nice. It's, uh, you never get away from your job, though. It's always there. So we maintain it. We keep it this way. And um, as part of a five-year warranty period on the job, we will maintain it during that full time. And during that time, we will be training select staff within the Vatican to take over that maintenance. Always important. So we are monitoring the climate, the interior climate. And this is just our sensors and work that is being done. I mean, this is this is a combination of what the Vatican Museum has and what we have. We put in quite a bit in 93. I didn't mention earlier, we we're actually doing dew point sensing. The primary set point of this system is to maintain what's called a dew point depression, at least 10 degrees C below the surface temperature of the fresco wall where the, where the painting is actually done. So anytime the wall temperature changes because of what's happening outside, and there's a two to three day lag. Let's say you had a heat spike and you had a warm day, two, three warm days, it'll be up to three days before the wall on the inside even feels that and registers that. We've added the CO2 sensors, doing a lot of uh, work, not only around the control of the air quality, but we've taken our Linnell group and some of the work that they've been doing on the security camera side and have turned it into an innovative people counting algorithm so we know as people are coming into the chapel, how many there are, how dense the population is getting, and we proactively make adjustments in what the system is doing. We do not wait for a change in set point sufficient to drive the control to more capacity or less capacity. So we're making decisions right as the population is changing. A lot of testing was done, as I had mentioned along the way. Jackie, you're in all well there, right? In that picture, we were doing some work with the, uh, the the plate in front. That is the inside of the skid where it was all tested. There's the main lab in France where we brought the equipment in on some of the side bays. If people are familiar with our TR21, it's a, a small version of what we have on the Thompson Road site where we bring in very large equipment and do all full, uh, full load testing. And then that's the web control system down below on the right being run out and tested. So here are pictures of, there is the diffuser brought forward now from the glass, six of these. And let's just build the system. This is what it looks like on the outside. Here's a little person to give you a sense of scale. This is not small equipment. So the diffusers under each window, four supplies, one each return outboard for a total of six. The dry coolers, which if we don't use the heat of compression coming out of the cooling side for reheat, we have to exhaust it to the atmosphere. We do use that. And uh, if we do not have the reheat capability from the capture heat, there's electric heaters. We used to be tied into some of the boilers, but the, the reliability wasn't there. So it's a total standalone. They brought, thank goodness, a new electrical service over to the area dedicated to this equipment. So we're not on board with other adjacent equipment. Ductwork, of course, 
lots of it, but all in one tight little location. Air handling units shown dramatic or diagrammatically on the left. And just to give you an idea how sensitive they were for weight, this, this looks like a uh, masonry stucco, you know, just like the rest of the stuff at the chapel. It's plywood with stucco over it. It's probably uh, two pounds per square foot, very light. Everything was done to keep the weight down. And the machinery rooms, which are called skids, and had the chillers and the pumps and everything inside them. During the time that we changed out the system, a million and a half people visited, and we had a temporary system on the other wall. So while we're deconstructing on the outside on the south wall, we have put in temporary equipment to handle the full load in July, August, and September, the hottest months. So it was, it was a, an added little thing we had to do. What we've seen so far, We've got three times the capacity. What we've noticed in our run time so far in October, we haven't even hit half capacity of the system, and there's about 11 or 1,200 people on the camera count. So we're confident that we're going to have that needed capacity, twice the efficiency. So we're using a little more power because we raised the capacity by three, but we cut the per unit down in half. We uh, We'll say now nearly invisible. The original diffusers were invisible unless you climbed the ladder on the far opposite wall or hit a, another viewing point. We've maintained near HEPA filtration, a lot of pre-filters. We've got some gas phase filters. Um, I think it's potassium permanganate. They need to be changed out and really loaded up, but we put in all the high levels of filtration, and we're working with the Vatican now to try and put in an air washer system for the people, kind of to scrub you off before you come in. So if you were coming down the stairs from the uh, Raphael rooms, you're coming up from the cafeteria there in the basement and entering in by the altar, you'll get an air washing if, if they go ahead with it. We've been pushing that for years, but literally we got to clean you off before you go in there because it's really some of the biggest problems. Having a recirculation system will help. Very quiet, energy efficient. We have the backup. We have the capability and confidence to handle the 2,000 people. I will come back to the video, but if you go to youtube.com slash UTCBIS, we publish a lot of videos, tell you all about our products, and hide hidden down a little bit further will be the video that I show, will show here, so you can take a look at it later if you would like to. Four years, and it's been a lot of fun. What do I enjoy the most? Stuff like that, roaming around outside, looking at the equipment with my camera and my jeans. And what did the boss think about? Great satisfaction. This, uh, I caught Michelle just before we were going in. He's looking down on the whole experience of what actually transpired. I mean, it's, you work for years, and then all of a sudden it's done. Excuse me, it's done, and there it is. I'm like, wow, did it really happen? Quite a bit of this going on, and will continue to go on for years. Anybody that knows about bringing a system out and commissioning, it's, it's not done the day you open, it's not done the day you walk away a month later, it continues for quite a while. And we will continue to do that. We had a good time and uh, we got to celebrate a little bit. This is when we were part of the 800 people when they brought us in to view the whole thing. So it was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. It's part of preserving cultural heritage. We talked about one of the most fantastic places to actually do the work. We'd like to continue doing this kind of work. We encourage all air conditioning engineers that have the opportunity to latch on to these kind of jobs. You know, love you to use our equipment, but that doesn't matter. We still need to preserve the things that are there in the museums. And this one, different than many others, we didn't have objects hung on the wall or 
brought out of the basement for showings, you know, things that changed. It is the building itself embedded in the surface of the airport. These are places in Europe. A lot of work has been done on a number of museums and are continuing to do this kind of work. I could probably do a list for here in the United States, but I, I just left the exhibit presentation. So what I would like to do is go ahead and play the video, and then we'll have time for some more Q&A. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.